Good morning. Today is second to last uh, practicum of the course. I hope you've been liking it so far. It's been quite an interesting semester. Uh, all remote, all digital, new material halfway through the semester. I don't know why, because I'm crazy. Um, so, so, so what do we talk about today? Uh, last week, let's start with a small recap. Last time we started talking about planning and control, like a three part story, right? So last week was part one. And so this was uh, the, the first part here. So it was model predictive control, uh, where we were back propping through the kinematic equation uh, of the of the of the system, right? We had like the state update equation and then minimization with respect to the latent minimization of what? Uh, we defined a cost last time, right? And the cost was the, uh, initially we said it was the Euclid square Euclidean distance to the target, right? So after we had this basically recurrent neural network uh, with this latent input, which is like our control in this case, and initial state, which was the initial uh, configuration of the system, then we evolve the trajectory and then we fix we set that the final state of this trajectory has to be closed. So we put a spring in quadratic terms, right? To the final location destination target. That was last time. Today, instead, we're going to be talking about the track backer upper. What is this stuff? So this is like an article from the 90s, I believe. We're going to see now very soon. So it's like a fundamental article that is you know, relevant to, uh, to understand what everyone is doing these days. And so in this case, today, we're going to be learning in an emulator of the kinematics forum observations. Why is this necessary? Because sometimes, well, oftentimes, you might not have access to what is the uh, law of motion of the system at hand. Uh, you need to be a physicist or a me mechanic or, you know, have to have pre-regress knowledge. Um, to come up with those equations that we came up last time. Remember the cosine of theta, sine of theta multiplied by the speed and so on. Um, but here we can just observe a whatever vehicle moving, right? So given observations, when we can actually infer what is the function that is governing the state update of this system, right? So this is like, finally, no machine learning. Still, uh, we're going to be uh, playing with easy version right today, like next week, even more complicated things. Finally, uh, still today, we're going to be training a policy, um, which, yeah, no one has made it work so far. So uh, if you if you make it work, you, you're, you're, you're going to get a big extra bonus uh, for, for class or for whatever, no? In your, uh, you know, we are going to be very happy if you uh, get this to work, right? Because it means you, you spend some time and you got it to understand and, and you develop some skills. Anyway, so we were going to be training a policy or a controller, which is nothing but uh, basically coming up with those optimal actions, which are the minimizers of that cost we defined before. And so this is called... Um, amortized inference, right? So like we have seen, uh, for example, when training a autoencoder or even before with the target prop, we were first doing a minimization in the latent space. Then we had the target and then we were trying to predict the target through the encoder. So that was the target prop. Or later on, we just completely removed that double step. And then we were just doing a training, training of the autoencoder. Uh, where you automatically learn this encoding part uh, that is going to give you the optimal uh, eventually code. Okay? So then there is a third part next week, which is this planning and prediction planning under uncertainty, which adds stochasticity to the environment, uncertainty and minimization for the uncertainty of the forward model minimization done by the controller. And then the final part was also introducing some latent decoupling, which basically we had some information leak. Again, this was like a small recap. Oh yeah, one more thing, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, let's, let's also see one extra slide from last time. 
such that everyone is on, on the same page. Um, the state transition uh, equations were those equations that allow us to define and, 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 and see how this state evolved over time, right? And so we said that we had this pink ball X, right? So pink ball X represents the state, okay? And so we have a pink ball X, the state, and then we have a orange um, called U. Since it's orange, you already know it's a latent variable. In this case, we call it control, but it's the same, same, same thing. You just change the name for the same thing. So instead of having Z, we have U. Instead of COVID calling it latent, we call it control. That is exactly the same thing. So, you know, whatever, it's just two names for the same thing, right? Uh, X, fortunately, we kept the same word, right? Um, but I think today, no, I think even today we're going to call it X. Uh, in, uh, in, in the RL literature instead, unfortunately, they change letters, right? And they call X S for state or O for observation, depending. Um, and then U is called A for action, right? But, but we don't like RL, so we use, you know, proper notation. Anyway, jokes aside, we define also later on uh, that we said that this x dot means the temporal derivative of this x state. And moreover, this pink ball x, pink uh, orange ball u, those are function of times, okay? So these were continuous function of time. Um, and finally, we introduce a... So this was a differential equation. Then we introduced this discretization, which gives us this difference equation, okay? And then, you know, the corresponding version. Anyway, moving on, and we start today version of the lesson. The track, Becker, Upper, and Guyen, and Widrow, 1990, okay? So what is the setup, right? So we're gonna be trying to design by self-learning, of a nonlinear controller, which means a neural net, to control the steering of a trailer truck while backing up to a loading dock from an arbitrary initial position. Only backing up is allowed. So what, what does it mean this stuff, right? So self-learning means that we have like, uh, all the ingredients on our side, we don't need to collect data. We can generate fake data. Well, we can generate data because we actually have access to the kinematic model, but we will generate this observation, which could be, you know, possibly collected uh, on the field. And then we, we perform the learning, but again, self-learning because we don't have to actually get labeled data. Uh, Nonlinear controller means neural net. To control, we, we learn what is controlling, changing the U, no? finding the U. So again, this is going to be the part of amortizing inference, right? So learning to control, right? Learning to generate those optimal actions. To steer this trailer truck, but we go backwards, right? Okay, interesting. Why do we go backward? Um, because we can learn how to park, right? How many of you drive? Can you parallel park? Answer me. Can you parallel park if you drive? No. Okay. Have you ever tried to parallel park when you actually have like a trailer behind your car? Like if you're, if you're going like camping, you know, it's, it's crazy. Trust me. We're going to be trying this together now. Um, it's not that uh, straightforward. Anyway, moving on, we have uh, the configuration of our uh, vehicle. Our agent is the following. It has like a cab in the front here, which has a given angle, theta, like last time. And then we have this X cab, which is the position of the uh, yolk, I think it's called. Yolk, Y-O-K-E, yolk, this location over here. Uh, and then, so we have X and, X and Y, right? Then we have theta, so we have three items so far, like we had uh, last week. Uh, moreover, we have also the angle of the trailer, right? 
And then we have X and Y location of this location over here, right? Um, here you can count one, two, three, four, five, six variable. Actually, uh, only five would be necessary uh, because it's a rigid body. But anyway, uh, here instead, if we have the X and Y location of the dock, docking station, okay? So this is the truck and the trailer and loading dock. Cool. So what are the state variables? So we have the angle theta cab, the angle of the truck, the X cab and Y cab, the Cartesian position of the yoke, the X trailer and the Y trailer, and the Cartesian position of the rear of the center of the trailer, theta trailer, the angle of the trailer. Okay. So we have these six, uh, six variables. Cool. So let, let's see what we're going to be doing then. So the protocol is the following. Now we're going to be trying to play with this. The truck backs up until it hits the dock. Then it stops. The goal is to back, uh, to have the back of the trailer to be parallel to the docking station. So you want to have, basically, if this is the docking station, you want to have the um, truck that is, you know, the or orthogonal, right? Like the back of the truck should be parallel. Um, moreover, you want to be as close as possible to the X trailer, Y trailer, right? So uh, the X trailer, Y trailer has to be the closest as possible to the X dock, Y dock. Okay, okay, okay. So is it going to be hard? It's going to be easy. Let, let's try out. Right? All right, cool. So we got Conda activate PDL. Then we got Jupyter Notebook. Okay. Uh, and then we go with the truck backer wrapper. All right. So we haven't yet seen these equations. We're going to see that in a second. We're going to be just running this. And then this is like the this is basically the uh, updates that are necessary. Well, this is for drawing, so we don't really care. Uh, and then here are the update equations. These are discrete update equations, similarly to what we have seen last week. But then there is an additional term here, uh, which we are going to be looking at in a second. But doesn't so it's not that much different, right? So we have seen last time that the uh, speed update, no, the x dot. Well, so we had the the next x, no, the next position is going to be the speed times the cosine times the delta t. Right? So itself plus, right? This then itself plus the delta, right? And so on. And this one is there was the itself, no, the theta uh, plus this. So the itself plus the uh, speed divided by the length of the uh, cab times the tangent of the phi, the angle, times the dt. Right? And this additional term, we're going to see again in a second. All right, so here we go. So this is our track. Right? Our objective is to get this back over here. Let me restart because it's in an unfortunate position. Uh, let's go with a very easy starting position. Maybe a bit closer. Uh -huh. Okay, so now I'm asking on the on the chat here what I should provide is a angle for the steering wheel, such that we can go from this location back to basically parking here. So tell me, someone on on the chat, what would you like to do? What angle would you like me to steer the wheel? Someone out of the 40, 50 people in class, tell me what angle would you like 30 degrees? So plus 30 degrees, I'm going to be doing uh, 10 steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay. So if I actually keep going like that, you uh, end up in an issue which is called jackknife. And when you jackknife, basically means you cut yourself, like you, you, you run into yourself. Okay. Yeah, it will break, right? So how do we exit this situation? So you can tell me some minus 60. Okay, someone is saying. 
So I'm going to be saying going here, minus 60. Okay. Tuck. More. Would you like me to go more or? So now if I go straight, I can go just backwards, right? So if I go uh, just zero here, now I can actually go back. Ta -ta 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 -ta. What angle would you like me to try now? So we can actually keep going, right? Oh, 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 oh. So we should have some sort of positive angle, right? Let's try 15, maybe. No, no, no. It's wrong direction, right? Maybe minus 15. So minus 15 means I have my wheels towards the right. Uh, 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 okay, I just broke the thing. Okay, so I just jackknife the thing. So le le let's try again, maybe once again. Now someone tell me exactly. Okay, let's start again from an easy position here. What angle would you like me to try? Quick, quick, so we don't have, we don't waste the whole lesson on this. Camila, you suggested something. I don't know what you suggested. Tell me what angle would you like to try? Minus 70. How do you steer minus 70? The, the wheels, no? Go. <laughs> the wheel can go 45 degree to 45 degree. 10 degree, okay. Uh, plus 10, right? So I go plus 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So this one basically go like this, right? Doesn't make sense. So we try minus 30. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. This seems to be okay, right? So now I can actually go with zero, maybe. And now we actually had to do some positive, right? Some, let's say 10. Maybe a little bit more. 20. See, see, we are getting there. And maybe zero now. But okay, you, you understand, right? This is I'm gonna be getting nuts. Uh, uh, doesn't work, right? So you have to do the other way around, I think. Anyway, you, you understand, you can play later on with this thing. It's fun. All right, so the, the, the objective is actually to try to drive this thing here and by manual uh, inspection looks like not quite easy task. OK, anyway, going back to the slides. Ah, fuck. Sorry, I just messed up things. OK, there we go. All right, cool. Moving on training. OK, so we perform training. What, what, what training of the world? So there is a two stage learning process, right? First, we're going to be training a neural network to be an emulator of the truck and trailer kinematics. First, second, we're going to be training a network, a neural net uh, controller to control the emulator. Right? So we're going to be learning the thing I was doing right now. Click, 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 click. But also we're going to be learning a kinematic model, right? Again, why is this necessary? Well, it's not necessary. You can backprop through the equation of the uh, motion as we have seen last week. Uh, on the other side, we may want to be able to be more gener general, right? And be able to learn any type of uh, kind of motion, like, uh, how do you call it? Any kind of behavior, right? If you have a different type of vehicle, you want to be able to learn uh, how they state evolve from observation, right? You don't necessarily have access to these equations. Right. So this is, this is the diagram. This is like the electrical engineering diagram. I'm, I'm just to. Um, so here we have the steering signal K at time index, uh, discrete temporal index K, right? So this is my phi. Then I have the trailer truck kinematics. And then I have a state at time uh, index K plus one. Uh, and this one has uh, it should be the other way around, right? So this is like, it should be a, te a temporal delay, right? So this should be K, this should be K, and this is going to be in theory K minus one, right? So again, 
I, I think this is not uh, our correct notation. Right? So it should be k, k here, k minus one because there is a delta. Cool. Uh, yeah, and so here we have the controller, which is going to give us the steering control. And then given the previous state and the steering control, this trailer track kinematics is going to tell us what is going to be the next state. So the state, uh, the discrete temporal index K is fed to the controller, which provides a steering signal at the discrete temporal index K between minus one, a hard right, and plus one, a hard left. Uh, to the track. The temporal index, right? The, the time index is k. Each time cycle, the track backs up by a fixed uh, small distance. So we have that the speed, s, is actually uh, negative. So you go backwards that we have seen so far. So these are the uh, equations we be uh, using for this specific example, right? So we already seen last week, uh, x dot, y dot, and theta zero dot. Today we have an additional theta one, which is going to be the s divided by d one, which is the distance between the center of the uh, wheels of this, you know, uh, track uh, trailer to the dock, basically, not to the yoke. And you can actually have multiple thetas for all these other, uh, you know, multiple trucks. So S is going to be the sign speed, in which uh, in our case is going to be equal to minus one, a negative number. And then this theta uh, phi is actually the angle here, the positive to the left, right? So this is wrong uh, notation on this should be the, so this is my negative phi, no positive phi should be this, this angle over here. So we have the X and Y of the trailer are determined, are determined uh, by the x and y of the cab, d1 and theta1, right? So we don't necessarily, we shouldn't need uh, these two items for the state variable, right? So we said before we were going to be using six. Let me show you here again. again. We said that we had one, two, three, four, five, six variables. It's not necessary, right? Because if you do have the X and Y location, uh, you have the angle and you have the distance, then you don't need X and Y of the back, right? But maybe it's uh, convenient for learning. I don't know. You know, sometimes different reparameterization help. Cool. Are there questions so far? No, no questions, right? We haven't yet done any major uh, stuff. So, First part is going to be the training of the neural net track emulator, right? So how do we do this? Well, this is going to be like the self-learning uh, bit. Uh, we're going to be providing, providing a random steering signal, uh, phi, to both the track dynamics, which is going to give us the next state, and the neural net emulator, right? So both of them are fed with this steering signal. So we have phi here, phi here. And then both of them have the previous state, uh, which here is called state at time index, time index k. Uh, so you have same state and same state. The track dynamics produces an output right here. And the output is going to be used to, um, to be, is going to be subtracted basically. Well, the, the, the prediction, right, from the network emulator is going to be subtracted by the actual target, right? And so now the error is proportional to the difference of these two items, right? And so this error is used for updating the parameters. So this symbol over here, this arrow here means that it's a module and the tune, the tunability, like the, the tune, um, the, 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 the signal you're using for tuning the parameters of this module is proportional to the distance between the target and the prediction. Okay. Question for people at home right now, right? So these people was written way before deep learning. So there is no standard notation. Well, this was the standard at the time, right? This is electrical engineering. But here I'm telling you, 
that the error, which is again the difference between the target and my prediction, is used to update um, these parameters. Right? So it's also said to adapt the parameter, they call it. So which kind of loss do you recognize as being used in this case? Right? If the signal that is used to update the parameters is proportional to the difference between the target and the prediction. You, you understand the question? So Jeffrey is say the one L one loss. And someone else can try something else. Someone else, Nitish is suggesting MSC. And Camila is suggesting a hinge. So Nitish, why do you see why do you say MSC? So MSC involve a square, right? But here we don't have a square. Why do you say an MSC? Exactly, right? So you, I mentioned that it's proportional to the difference. And so what we use to change, right? Uh, the, the, the values is going to be the gradient and the gradient coming from an MSC is going to be just the dif difference, right? So if you compute the the, the derivative right of a mean square, mean square error you're gonna get the uh you're gonna get just the the, the difference right so that that's the, that's the correct answer cool uh, is it clear right i hope so so again sometimes when you read these old papers they are really informative but then they use different notation or different jargon and you had to somehow translate back to reality not to, to current times uh okay da, 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 da. so figure three shows uh this train how to train the emulator the track backs up randomly the emulator learns to generate the next position state vector given the present state vector and the steering signal okay so you simply by observing what is the update um, of like what is the next position and given that you also have access to the control the phi you can basically learn what are the equations that are governing the kinematics of your uh, agent and so the state transition flow diagram is the following right so here we have c represents the controller and then T represents the track and trailer emulator. So we have an initial position as uh, zero. See that I was I was telling you before in uh, control and machine learning we use X in reinforcement learning and in this old paper they use S right. But S was the speed right. So that's not too good because now S is two different things. Although they never use S right. That was the questions I introduced. Anyway, so we have an initial position, initial, sorry, initial configuration, initial state. Uh, then the state goes inside the uh, controller, which gives me the possible phi, the angle. The initial state also goes inside the track, uh, track and trailer emulator, and I get the next state. Then the next state goes inside the controller, you get the next phi, the next control which goes inside this tra trailer track and then you get the next here, right? So this is like uh, before the input to our um, T, which was actually the uh, kinematic equations was an input, right? So before we didn't have this C, we had a latent, we had a latent here, we had a latent here, we had a latent here. Now we no longer have latent, we have a neural network, which is producing the but it's no longer latent, it's going to be hidden, right? So it's going to be the hidden representation, or in this case, it's called control, uh, which is a function, no? a non-linear function of the initial state. So or policy has to provide the action or control given the state it finds itself in, right? So it's simply a regressor network. And in this case, uh, let, let's see if you can tell me, no? what is the size of this S0? We should know because I told you already. Answer me. What is the size of S0?
El lobo. Who was following? The position of the cab and the track, yes. So position of the two things are going to be four, right? X and Y, X and Y, but there is two more variables. We also have the angle, right? We had, yeah. So how many variables do you count? Six, fantastic. So S is uh, six dimensional. Uh, so it's a network which has, it takes a six input, six dimensional input vector. What is the output size? Here, this arrow here, what's the size of this guy over here? What is the size of the output of the controller? Let's see if you follow. The signal, yeah, what, how many dimension has this signal? Two, one, yeah, one is just the angle, right? So we don't have the acceleration. It would, it would have been two in the last lesson, no? When we had both the angle and the acceleration. In this case, uh, we don't change the acceleration. We only change the angle. We move at a constant speed, okay? But yes, uh, one or two, depending. In this case, one. Cool. So this one uh, you already know. So this is not gonna be uh, big news because we already seen this uh, last week. But anyway, so we have a controller connected to this trailer track, right? This trailer emulator. Uh, this is fed with the previous state, right? Uh, the x uh, h at the in discrete temporal index. Because I cannot say time, no? Because these are temporal indexes, are discrete numbers. It belongs to n, no? The, the, the natural numbers. So anyway, h, bold h, the hidden layer, it's going to be a function of the discrete temporal index k minus 1 here, fed to the controller and the track. And then this one gives me the um, h at tem temporal index k. So, and then this is package, right? So if you package everything like that, you can think about this as a module which has no input actually no that input is not connected anywhere and so this one is like one of these classical modules uh we have seen in uh, rnn right so we have an initial state an initial hidden layer uh initial hidden state initial track location and configuration and then on the other side we still have multiple of these blocks until we reach a final, uh, you know, final capital K uh, number of steps, which is my final hidden state, um, which is my final configuration. So when do we reach this capital K? So there are a few conditions we can meet to end uh, our, you know, unrolling basically in time, right? Um, so. The conditions are or you jackknife. So if you, if you, if you click, you, you cut yourself, then, you know, end of the episode, uh, you hit an edge, right? One of the, the, the boundaries, right? So you, you hit something and then that should be ended. And then you try to get to be hitting, you know, the, the docking station. Uh, so you also want to minimize the, the distance with the, whenever you hit something. Uh, and then there's one more, which is, I think, when you reach like a uh, maximum number of steps. And that should be it, I believe. So these are the three different conditions that are, you know, uh, telling you when you reach capital K. Cool. So this is actually uh, the, the, the how the training works again with these diagrams representing basically uh, backprop. Uh, in the gradient descent, right? So you have here that this, the difference between our final desired target, which is going to be horizontal look, uh, orientation, then the docking, like the trailer location needs to be the same as the docking station, right? So you get the difference. So I got an MSC and you try to use that one to update the controller. Um, it's not exactly like that. So this is actually travels through all previous TC modules, right? The visualization shows only that all C blocks are updated also proportionally to the final error, right? Which implies the MSC loss. Um, 
So yeah, backprop goes through the ho the whole thing, right? This doesn't mean that the controllers are only updated through on the because of the this, this difference, right? Okay, 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 cool. And so we have basically put the two parts together. So this is the updating learning of the controller, whereas before we have seen how we perform the uh, learning of the network emulator, right? So network emulator learning here, which is not necessarily uh, ne necessary to actually do this, right? Because if these T's are differentiable, then, you know, just go use the original equations, right? All right, finally, um, we have the final two parts. So the initial position uh, is set at random. The track backs up until it stops. The final error is used for back propagation. Back propagation through time, basically, right? Uh, with unrolling period of capital K. Uh, the weights changes in uh, C in the controller are taken as the sum of the tentative changes. W what does this mean? Well, this simply means you're going to be using PyTorch, which is accumulating the gradient, right? So this is why, uh, finally, we found a case where uh, you don't want to zero the grad during the process, right? So remember, every time we have the five steps, you know, uh, feed forward, uh, compute the loss, zero the, the grad, compute backward, step, right? So these are the five different steps for training a network for doing classification or whatever. In this case, instead, it's important to actually have the, the weight changes in C are taken as the sum right of, of the tentative changes what does this mean this means that when you perform back prop right and you go back prop here so here you compute your first uh let's say you first zero out the gradient right so we start with cleanup version and here you generate uh your first gradient of uh you know partial derivative of the loss with respect to the parameters of the controller then as we keep going we still see more modules C. And so in this case, the partial derivatives that we get with respect to the weights needs to be summed to what we have done already so far, right? You, you cannot overwrite that because otherwise, if you keep overwriting, you're going to just compute the partial derivative with respect to the only the first module over here, right? Instead, you want to have the sum of the gradients throughout the chain, no? Again, this was not straightforward, maybe in a, with previous framework or where there were not even framework, right? Uh, so it, someone actually th thought that it's necessary to specify. In our case, using PyTorch and just do a for loop, everything is done. So uh, nice. Finally, repeat this uh, another with another initial position until uh, it backs up until. Uh, and allowing it to back up until it stops, right? So eventually, like, again, this is simply re-seeing things that we have already seen before. We have a something, it is analogous to having a neural net, having a number of layers equal to four times the number of backing up steps. Why is that? because you have a controller. So the number of uh, step variables with initial position of the track, hold on, uh, the number of step uh, of course, with initial position of the track and trailer. Yeah, so what happens here is that you're gonna have, as you have seen this one right here, you basically unroll as many times, right? As you have capital K items. So only capital K is gonna be given to you by one of the stopping condition, you jack knife, you hit one of the uh, edges or you run out of time, time steps, right? And so you basically train a network which has different length, right? So these networks have different temporal extension. And then you train the parameters, given that there is no actual input, right? The only input you have, well, is the initial condition, right? And then you have this evolution of the state 
And then whenever this evolution of the state reaches an end, then you enforce the final uh, state to be what you want, right? Which was this location and this orientation. Does it work? Yeah, it works. So this is the initial state, for example. And then you, after training, you're going to get that the network, no, the controller and manages to back up until it reaches the docking station, until it gets here, right? Which we didn't set, we have a constant speed, right? So we don't have, uh, we don't control that. Or in this other case, which is rather adversarial, it has to basically, so what does this controller have to do? It has to find basically a kind of vector field, sort of speaking, like for every location in this six dimensional space no, of configuration of the track, it has to give you a scalar. So in this case, yeah, in this case is a scalar field, uh, and which is telling you what is the direction you should be steering, right? So you have basically ending up with this temporal u of t no, function, which is giving you what are the correct uh, orientation of the wheels you have to have in order to be able to park, right? And so this was basically pointing away and then you have even one more crazy. You start basically in a jackknife position and then the track learns how to steer all around to get back here. So someone that tried to already implement this one had the issue that the, the track was always, you know, uh, jackknifing. And so you may want to add additional uh, terms in the loss, in the, in the cost, which is going to be basically uh, the agreement of the two, like a, a distance between the two angles, right? So if the two are aligned, it's good. If, this, if the two angles, the two orientations, the two thetas are at 90 degrees, then you're going to end up in this kind of uh, inconvenient situation. Um, so there are more resources as well if, you were, if you're interested in looking up this, right? So there is a full working demo. So this stuff actually works and you can check out uh, this one here. And so you can... We already, try man we already tried the manual uh, drive. We can try to use the controller. And maybe we can... I should have increased the simulation speed. Okay, there we go. There you go, see? So this was just nice. So uh, currently I said at the beginning that no one got this one to actually work for our PyTorch uh, notebook. So if you get that to run, it's going to be a very big um, extra credit, let's say, <laughs> for you. Uh, and but we still see something, right? So we can still see how to get there, right? So let's let's be on the let's check the notebook. Unless other are there questions before we actually move the notebook? Questions? Questions? No. Okay. So we saw this one where we have the uh, representation. Uh, then we start here with this. Um, I import torch, right? Uh, in this case, what do I do? So in this case, I just show you 10 episodes, right? What it does. So we, how do we train this uh, emulator of the kinematics? So we said we start with random, right? So theta uh, phi is going to be a random value uh, between pi half and uh, pi fourth and, and minus pi fourth, right? So what happens is the following, right? So you end up, you start with random uh, positions, you provide random input and you keep, uh, you know, simulating until this stuff basically breaks, no? In a jackknife position, or it, it reaches a edge. So this one you, you do many times, right? Now it's very slow because I also visualize, I also render the, the things, right? But we don't have to render things, right? So whenever you, we actually, so yeah, whenever we actually do this in, in, in actual in reality, I can, this was like 10 episodes, I can here 
and comment this one. So I don't have the rendering on. And I do this for 10,000 10, episodes, right? And so here, basically, what I'm doing. Let's check what I'm doing. We have an initial state, which I, I query the track with the initial state. Then I have this file that has a random number, basically from 0 to 1. Then I subtract uh, 0.5, so it's minus 0 0.5 to plus 0.5 times uh, pi half, right? So it's going to be a minus pi fourth to pi fourth. Then I append this theta, uh, sorry, phi, and then the initial expanded state. And then we have the output, so it's going to be the uh, final uh, location, no? or like final configuration. Potentially, I draw. Right? Uh, then we can check what is the length. Uh, these are all the combinations, right? OK, there is a question. Could you explain the weight sum necessary in, the, in this case? Hold on. Weight sum necessary in, the, in this case at the end again. If the track has already moved to the new position, why would you need? Um, yeah, yeah. So, so what I what I was saying before is that when you when you train the system to reach a final destination, so this is one trajectory, okay? So when you backprop through this chain of controller and and track emulator you actually need to accumulate the gradients when you perform backprop, right? So this controller is the same as this controller is the same as this controller. If PyTorch wouldn't have a accumulation function, when you compute the partial for this one, you compute you know, the partial derivative of the loss with respect to this weight. But then when you compute the partial of this one, you would be basically overriding what were the partial for this guy here. Instead, the default behavior for PyTorch is to accumulate the partial derivatives with respect to the weights, right? And so whenever you unroll this for loop, basically, when you get again to the C, you're going to be adding the new partial derivative with respect to the weights to what we already had before, right? For this time, right? So if you think about it, this is like a for loop, right? So you have four until well, while not break, right? While not break, you have this, you know, repeating multiple times. And so when back prop goes in the other direction, you want to keep summing the partial with respect to the weight for every time you had this controller inside the for loop for the one given trajectory, okay? Then when you start a new trajectory, then you don't have this anymore. So in the notebook, are we just learning a controller since our model is known and differentiable or did you include a network to learn a model, right? So here I just, uh, I'm, I'm going through right now, right? So here we have a state which had six, which has six input, uh, six variables, right? And we have steering size equal one and then hidden size equal 45. That's the same as if done in the, in the paper. And so this is my network emulator. It's a sequential, right? It's a, fully connected network going from six plus one, um, one plus six, right? To 45. Then I have a, a positive part. And then I have again this from the hidden, hidden layer size to this state size, right? So this is my trailer track emulator. SGD, MSC loss, right? Whatever. I transform these as uh, tensors, right? I compute uh, mean and standard deviation. I split for training and test. I check what is the size for the training. And then here we perform the uh, training of the system. Okay? And it looks like it's doing a quite good of a job, right? So it's very tiny. Oh, OK, went up a little bit. Anyway, so here I'm just training the uh, trailer track kinematics, right? And then given this, the, the, this is the far, last part, which is left for you as an exercise, which is like, uh, now that you actually have the trailer track, kinematics emu uh, emulator, train the controller, right? 
So you just have to train now this controller as an element of this recurrent network. So this is not your recurrent network, right? This is supervised learning or self-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning. What do you want to call it? I don't know. No, uh, no, semi. Self, right? Self-supervised learning. Uh, because we we have like a given function, right? We we generated the data and then we just want to learn those, right? And so this is supervised learning basically again. And then given that you have this model, you will have to possibly train later the controller within this uh, thing. Anyway, moving on, second part of the class in the next five minutes. So in this quick uh, second part of the class, we're going to be talking about Bayesian neural networks, estimating a predictive distribution. What is this stuff? So why to care about uncertainty? All right. So question, if I have a dog, cat dog classifier, and I want to classify and I, I feed an image of a hippopotamus, what's going to happen? <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeffrey is suggesting 99% dog or cat. Uh, do we, tr do we trust Jeffrey? Maybe. Maybe we can actually try, right? Okay. So, so here I just open this cat dog detection. I choose a file. I'm going to be choosing a dog picture. And yes, we have a doggy. Okay. That's great. Let me actually zoom so you can see how cute this dog is. Okay. Very cute. All right, then we can choose another one. This is going to be a cat, of course, right? And there you go. Very nice cat. No, it doesn't tell you the confidence, but it looks like uh, it looks a very happy cat here. And of course, I'm going to be choosing a hippo. And then, of course, this is a dog, right? Well, not. Um, oh, I made a not joke. Joke. You know, those are English advanced jokes. Check a not. Not joke. <laughs> I'm crazy. Okay, it's, it's fine. All right, cool. So as we have understood, well, as we knew, we, this stuff was, uh, was not going to be end up ending up very well. Uh, moreover, we may want to be, have some sort of reliability in steering control. What does it mean? So you want to know how certain you are taking a specific, you know, uh, change in your steering control, right? So maybe you may not want to take a, you know, steer completely to the right option when you're not really certain about that. So this is important, right? So whenever you have this uh, regression output, how can you tell how reliable that outcome is, right? So if we have a estimate of the uncertainty with which a network tells you things, maybe it would be nicer, right? Physics simulator prediction, uh, you know, uncertainty in physics are omnipresent uh, and, you know, if you can also tell how a prediction is, that would allow physicists to be much, you know, happier. Uh, moreover, there is an you know, application in minimizing action randomness when connected to a reward. Uh, so one can decide to minimize this uncertainty as well. And this is something we're going to be seeing next week. Okay. So what is dropout? We didn't talk about dropout. Maybe Jan did. So dropout tells you how much or how many neurons you want to drop basically. And so basically you randomly, uh, set some neurons to zero inside your network. Right. And so every time the network basically architecture slightly changes, right. And usually this is used at uh, training time in order to have no single path from beginning to end, which is, you know, uh, memorizing overfitting on a specific data, right? So in this case, given that the network, we, we enforce basically a more distributed representation, right? And this animation, it's really, it took a lot of time anyway. Uh, so how does it work? This is all diagrams I'm aware. So we have now that the hidden layer of this network 
is going to be a you know, rot rotation of what? X element wise multiplied by this delta X. What is delta X? Well, delta X is something of the same size as X, right? The similar, similarly for dy prediction, it's going to be my H multi element wise multiplied by this delta H, which has the same size. Uh, and then these deltas are basically coming from, from a Bernoulli uh, distribution, which has a probability equal to one minus the dropping rate. Okay. So given that you have basically a, you, you, you zero out some of these items of the vector X on H, then all the other items need to be boost, boosted up, right? How much? Well, of course. So if you, if you have just 80% of these units set to one, then you want to divide by 0 0.8, uh, these deltas, right? So it's that the intensity, no, the, the, the norm overall doesn't change. Cool. Cool. All right. So we're going to be learning now how to making how to make this with a notebook, right? So in here, we are just trying to regress the uh, function that goes through these blue dots. And that function would be this red one over here, right? But then something that we don't have usually is the level of uncertainty around these points. Okay. So we sort of seen this, I think, in the second lab uh, when we talk about the uh, classification and regression, right? We saw that we could have trained multiple models, right? And then we could have computed the variance between the predictions in order to be able to tell how much is the level of agreement between networks. Today, we're going to be doing something very similar, but training only one network. Well, you know, it's sort of training multiple networks with this dropout, right? Use at inference. So <clears throat> we go here. And this is the last bit here. So we go on the Bayesian neural networks. We choose our PyTorch deep learning. All right. And we can sell run all. So what we do here is going to be training a network to learn, like to train a network that goes through this point, right? over here. And so if I use this one, so in this case, what kind of uh, activation function did I use? Can you tell me? Well, it's a real one. You can tell because this final function is basically a piecewise uh, combination of linear segments. Okay. Then I use a, let me show you the network, but here, so I have a network which has uses a real right uh, positive part, and then here I have a dropout no? with a dropping rate of five percent, both at the beginning and in the hidden layer. So this was just one prediction, and here instead I compute the uh, standard deviation basically of when I send forward the network multiple times, right? So in this case, I send my data point 100 times through the network. And then I compute here later on, what is the standard deviation across these multiple predictions? Uh, it is important to tell the network that we are in training mode, okay? So usually we don't want to have dropout on during inference. And so you have to set the network in evaluation mode and that's going to be turning off the dropout. In this case, we want to set the model, the network to training mode, such that the dropout is active even during inference, such that now I can compute the mean and send a deviation. The mean is going to be a better approximation of the final function. And then the standard deviation allows me to estimate what is the level of uncertainty with which a prediction, in this case, a regression is made. Okay. In this case, you can tell no, that the uncertainty nearby the location of the points is rather tiny, right? But then as you move away, it actually increases. 
it's interesting to notice that if I'm changing the activation function to hyperbolic tangent, things will look much different. So first of all, this is going to be the approximation right, of this function. It's no longer piecewise linear. And then finally, the estimation of the uncertainty goes like that. right? So we have both different amount of uncertainty before and after. And also, these tails now go horizontal because of the fact that, that the sigmoid is uh, when has those saturated uh, external parts, right? And then this is this kind of constant uh, amount of uncertainty. And that was pretty much everything I wanted to tell you uh, about today. Uh, any question about these topics? <laughs> Otherwise, next week, we're going to be putting together today lesson, both these two parts, the uncertainty estimation, the learning of the controller and the emulator. Plus last week, maybe, well, last week it was foundational, right? Uh, to, to learn the, about these topics. So next week we pack all together and we sprinkle some variational predictive conditional network and we can be delivering the final practicum of this semester course of deep learning uh, at NYU. Thank you for being with me today. Enjoy your day and I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.